According to the site Carbon Positive, over the next four decades, the world is projected to construct the equivalent of adding another New York City to the planet every 34 days. With that much rapid building expansion, how are we supposed to make it sustainable too? I'm Todd Wyant and welcome to the Bridging the Gap podcast. You're invited to join my mission to embrace and share the innovations transforming the AEC, MEP, and manufacturing industries. Today, I'm excited to be joined by founder and COO of Finestra Pro and lead green associate, Simon Whelan. Welcome to the podcast, Simon. Hey, Todd, how you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, thanks for coming. Uh, can you start by giving us just kind of a brief background on yourself and Finestra Pro? Sure, uh, yeah, happy to. Um, so uh, I'm one of the founders of Finestra Pro. I'm an architect by profession. Um, Myself and my co-founder Dave Palmer, we um, were we were both architects. We were practicing. We had a sort of a medium-sized firm here in Dublin, Ireland, where we're based, uh, um, which is why I'm, we're doing this by webcam. <laughs> so thanks for that. Uh, you know, and a lot of our time in practice was spent researching and doing a lot of uh, lecturing. And you know, we 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 did a lot of. Um, research with regards to environmental design, building performance, particularly around the envelope um, and the facade of the building, um, which is, I guess, in a lot of ways where um, uh, the genesis or the, the, uh, the seed of Finestra Pro was, was, was started from, you know, our own experience. We very much felt that there was a requirement for a tool for designers that could allow us to understand the implications of building performance and what they mean on the facade and on the aesthetic design of a building, particularly at early stage. We found it difficult to understand, um, you know, if you make a geometric decision or, you know, a performance decision, what, what did that mean on the aesthetic of the building? And, and I guess that's where uh, the idea, the, uh, the, the concept of Finestra Pro, Finestra Pro came from. Um, and uh, yeah, it, we've, we've been you know, uh, developing it and scaling the company ever since. We're still based here in Dublin. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you from a, a Georgian building uh, in the, the heart of Dublin City, hence the fireplace in the background. Um, so I suppose it, it really is a, a, a fireside chat today. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we, you know, and we've just, we've always been in, interested in environmental design, always in sustainability, because I think as designers, it's part of our role. It's part of our, uh, um, you know, responsibility to design the best performing buildings that we can. Nice. Uh, so what inspires you in the sustainability space? Um, yeah, well, like, like I just touched on, I guess, you know, build a performance. Um, you know, that's where my interest in, in sustainability came from. Uh, to me, performance should be as central a tenet in design um, as like form or function or any of those things. But like any good design, it should be, you know, invisible really. It should, as building occupants, we shouldn't be um, affected really, you know, in a negative sense by, um, by decisions that designers make. Um, you know, so good building performance means that we're comfortable as occupants, means that the building isn't using a lot of energy, means that, you know, all of, all of those boxes are ticked without it really negatively impacting on my use of, a, of my office or my home or, you know, a cinema or a retail unit or whatever that might be. So, so I guess, yeah, as to your question, I'm just inspired by embedding performance as a standard uh, into building design and just to be able to design buildings better, I guess. Yeah, very cool. That's important. Uh, so when a firm is looking at developing their sustainability strategy, where should they start? How should they go about putting together the strategy? Yeah, like it's it's tough, I, I think. And I think most people will, uh, will you know, agree with that. Um, sustainability in a firm or in any company, I guess, doesn't work unless it's uh, it, it's from the top down, you know, it needs to be led by um, management or led by principals or owners or whoever that might be. I mean, it is a much massive cultural shift in a lot of people's decision making. Um, and it's difficult for a company to implement sustainability initiatives, no matter how good the principle is or how good the will is, um, because it does take that top down to culture shift and operational changes to you know change workflows or whatever that might be um, to really become embedded in a firm 's day to day practices and activities you know mm -hmm. um, i 've always been a big believer in 
metrics and you know what's measurable is manageable i suppose um um and you know just like we if we were looking at you know financial you know we would do a budget and what what you know what are we spending now and you know same as that if a firm or a company wants to understand their environmental impacts they're going to need to understand well what are they you know what are their impacts right now and what are they spending from a certain point of view and how can they improve or better that you know so uh, as kind of a, a first baby step into developing that strategy would it be getting those benchmarks and getting pretty clear on what you're yeah, going after for sure for sure and that's i suppose um you know why things like you know architecture 2030 and the you know 2030 challenge are important because they really embed analytics and data and you know understanding our um current state you know so we can understand how to make that better where we where can we improve or what can we do you know yeah uh so you just mentioned some analytics how do you real realistically predict or, or analyze how sustainable a building is at an early stage when the performance is actually coming at much later yeah, 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 um, and it's again, it's 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 something that you know, from our point of view in Finestra Pro, that was a frustration for us. Yeah, you know, uh, you know, how could we understand performance from that early stage so that it wouldn't negatively, or, you know, wouldn't impact the design in a big way later on? Um, modeling, uh, data um, analysis. You know, um, I, I guess we're always getting better at that you know applications like finestra pro and you know other other tools are, are are out there and getting better at allowing us to you know understand these things earlier um they do take training yeah you know they do take understanding and and, and um you know that's maybe a resource that is a sacrifice that needs to be made you know um no model is perfect um um you know so it, it's that you know that whole garbage in garbage out idea you know so and again that's where building information modeling become modeling becomes huge because i suppose the whole method the whole principle behind bim is you know information in early and you know the more information the richer that model the richer that data the more accurate the analysis or the more accurate the um, the uh, the response that we can get out of it you know yeah, sure. So you mentioned the 2030 challenge earlier. Can you take a moment and just kind of unpack what it is at a high level? Very high level. Um, I suppose, you know, you touched on it, Todd, at the start there, like buildings account for 39, 40% um, of, of our global energy use and certainly our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so addressing this uh, to reduce and like, I suppose, eventually eliminate those kind of emissions is central to the Paris Agreement and, you know, um, uh, those, those, those targets that um, a, a number of countries have signed up to. So Architecture 2030 have issued this 2030 challenge where firms and I suppose the wider building community um, have pledged to reduce those fos that fossil fuel, fuel use um, to the point where we're pretty much carbon neutral um, by 2030. Um, as I just sort of touched on, core to this is reporting and data and metrics to monitor the improvement um, on the buildings that we design and deliver over the next 10 years, you know? Yeah. What do you see as some of the, the challenges that firms are are facing at if they, they, they're really trying to implement the 2030 challenge, but you know, what are some of the, the stumbling blocks that they need to be looking out for and, and how do they overcome those challenges of designing a sustainable building? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of challenges, I suppose. Um, um, in my experience, I suppose designers are quite environmental by their nature. Um, you know, um, there's this kind of interesting contradiction uh, to the architectural industry. Um, the architect is employed and paid by the developer, I suppose, but the product that they deliver at the end of the day is used by the occupants of that building. So who, therefore, is their responsibility to? The person who pays their bill or the people that are going to use their product, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, costs come is a big part of that. So, you know, the, as I said, the developer who's paying for the construction of that building is one is going to want to deliver it in as cost in a efficiently cost efficiently a manner as possible, you know. Yeah. Um, but we also have a responsibility to fight for the most environmental buildings we can, because very often, you know, the cost battle is one that we uh, too often lose because, you know, if, if someone won't pay for that 
pay for those initiatives, well, what are you going to do? And you've got to, you know, deal with those parameters or those limitations around cost, you know. But going back to, but like, I suppose, if we can justify those capital costs at the early stage as having a good return um, throughout the life cycle of the building, um, it becomes a little easier to see them implemented. So, and then going back to my earlier point, what we're trying to do and what we're trying to show at Finestra Pro is that tools can have these kind of invisible impacts on performance, that you can make decisions at that very early stage that aren't going to cost you anything, but are going to have better, you know, big impacts to better the, imp imp uh, the performance of the building, you know? So, um, yeah, like, you know, it, it can be difficult when you get into those costs, cost fights, but, um, um, you know, I think sustainability and environmental design and building performance is, you know, as we've been talking about, is becoming more and more mainstream and it's not as difficult to try and um, sell that idea as a designer, you know? Yeah. So you mentioned being able to, to justify it. Uh, uh, it makes me think of what we were talking about earlier with uh, the BIM model and being able to put more data and more information into that model earlier. It, it, to me, it seems like it would be an easier, uh, it gives you more uh, punch to, to be able to, to justify the, the impact of it because you could show this is what it's going to be like without it. This is what it's going to be like with it. And you're able to see that difference in where the cost breakdown is. Sure. For sure, um, absolutely, and it's about you know justifying those decisions. Um, all too often, architecture and building design is you know like anything is has become a sales job almost that you've got to sell your decisions to uh, you know sell your concept, sell your design to a developer, and then sell the the you know the building to people and whatever. And the best way to do that is to show the benefits, is to show the value, you, you know, and that longer term value that these decisions are bringing and that these, you know, more higher performing initiatives and sustainable uh, decisions are, are bringing, I suppose. And building information model modeling allows us to do that because it gives us good data, good analytics, you know, it can, and very often, and it can give us some pretty pictures and, you know, some really good, um, you know, graphical demonstrations of those decisions to, to, to sell that idea to, to, uh, the person who pays the pays the bills at the end of the day. The visualization component is uh, pretty cool about it. You can really see it. So sure. the the twenty thirty challenge, we're ten years out. Where do you think we'll be at the end of it as an industry? Uh, not sure. Um, better off, I hope. Um, again, you know, like I said, sustainability has become more and more mainstream. Has probably become and it probably has become or certainly will become more market driven um companies are very much realizing that you know designing more sustainable products um uh you know whether that be building materials or the buildings themselves um you know better processes better kind of value chains and all of those kind of things make better business sense and i think we're finding that those kind of wider market forces are resulting in buildings being designed and built to a much higher standard you know um multinationals, large companies, you know, public companies are, I think, going to need to start reporting environmental credentials or results alongside financial results. And it, you know, and it won't do for a large multinational to have poorly performing real estate as their HQ, for example, you know? Yeah. Do you think in 10 years that justification that we were just talking about will be easier or, or kind of gone away altogether? Yeah, it'll, it'll be easier, um, I think. You know, it's always getting easier. Um, but, the, you know, it, it'll, it'll be hard in other ways. It'll just change. You know, that we're always going to, you know, like it's not an easy thing to design a building, right? And nor should it be. Um, um, so the limitations that we're working within, those parameters that we're, you know, trying to design within, they're always going to change slightly. You know, whether it be environmental consider considerations or cost or planning considerations or whatever that might be, you know, so while it might be a little easier to, um, to justify designing a building, a really high performance building, it'll be difficult in other manners. I, uh, you know, who knows what that's going to be, but yeah, like it's, it's never going to be easy to design a building. Right. It'll just become easier in different parts of it, you know? Right. It's a complicated process. <laughs> sure. No getting around For that. Sure. Uh, For sure. 
So with all the, the current regulations and the demand for building with LEED certifications and all the other environmental accreditations, uh, you know, it's really putting a, a squeeze on designers to focus on efficiency. But how do you find that balance between the aesthetics of the building and then the performance of the building? Um, yeah, great question. And, and, you know, again, going back to our earliest days in Finestra Pro and before in, you know, architectural practice, I suppose, um, you know, that's the, that was the frustration or that was the, 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 the seed of the problem. Um, you know, your, your building facade and your, your envelope, typically speaking, accounts for um, about 50% of the building's use or certainly influences about 50% of the, of the, um, the, 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 the building's use. Um, wow. You know, while the facade is the embodiment, I suppose, of the building's architecture from the casual bystander or the person out in the street, um, yeah. you know, it's more than that. It's, I suppose, we always say it's that the moderator between the internal and the external environment. So it's hugely important. It's not just what the building looks like it's the skin and it's how the building lives or breathes, you know? Um, so yeah, like it influences about 50% of the building's use typically. I mean, it's not every building is going to be the same and, you know, certainly, but like, you know, typically speaking, we could say heat and light and, you know, natural daylighting and cooling and all of those things are very much influenced by the facade. So how do you find a balance? Well, that's the trick, isn't it? You know, um, you know, you can have a beautiful building that's really horrible to to uh, be in, or a building that like is, feels great to be in that looks really horrible from the outside. So, you know, where where how do you find the balance? You know. Yeah. Uh, so you, you touched on this some, uh, but wonder if you can unpack it a bit more. Of why do you need a high performing facade? Uh, well, I mean, I suppose, we, you know, we touched on it there, like a lot of the energy use of the building is, is directly influenced by the facade. Um, I think something like a quarter of the energy use or the embodied energy of a building is, you know, uh, used in construction stage, but 75% is in the operational stage. So if you've got a really poorly performing facade that is affecting a huge part of the energy use of that building, um, you know, it's... Um, it's 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 not great, right? Um, it's not great from with regards to the energy use that that building accounts for, but nor is it great for the person who has to use that building. I mean, we've all been in scenarios where we've um, you know been in a horrible office with poor to no daylight and you know a wall that's cold on one shoulder and you know all of those kind of things and and uh, it it affects um, it affects occupants in a big way, you know. Yeah, for sure. It's a, a, a very personal thing to me because our, our building, <laughs> we, we tease in the afternoon every single time. We're like, why didn't our building use Finestra Pro? Because the yeah. sun just pounds our building yeah. in the afternoon. Yeah, exactly, so, exactly, exactly. You know, and, and I suppose that's the relationship that we're trying to find, you know, that relationship between a high performance, you know, from a thermal point of view, for example, and that occupant comfort. And, you know, um, you know how, do, how do we how do we find that balance at that early stage, you know? Uh, any kind of touch points that designers should uh, be, be thinking of and thinking through when trying to strike that balance? Well, um, I suppose, um, yeah, like core to sustainable design and, you know, high performance design of, of, of buildings is the idea of passive, the passive considerations, you know? So in other words, um, heating or lighting or, you know, any of those things that don't use mechanical systems, don't use active systems. So what can we do to heat or cool or naturally light a building without turning on a switch, you know, and using energy? Um, so a couple of examples, for example, you know, we know that glass has a, it doesn't have as good a thermal performance as a, an opaque, you know, masonry wall. But that doesn't mean that we're going to build a building with no glass in it, right? Because if we did that, then we'd have no natural light. So therefore, we'd be turning on the lights, you know, so right. or poor occupant comfort in, from that point, point of view. Likewise, there's no real value in getting really good triple glazed, um, high thermally performing glazing um, if it's, you know, facing south. And like you touched on, you're, like the occupants are being 
cooked alive um, in a greenhouse, essentially leading to mechanical cooling, you know? So it's all about optimization. It's all about balance. And it's all about understanding these things at a very early stage. And like I said, these are the decisions that we can make, you know, from day one, day, day two of, of a design project that can have huge impacts in the performance of that building and the, the comfort of the occupants. Um, that cost little or nothing you know they don't change the cost of that design it's about making an informed decision and about you know uh, serving your client but also the occupant of the building you know sure yeah uh, so even though there's projected so much new growth with new buildings uh, there's a whole lot of existing buildings out there in the world how do you reconfigure an existing building with a more sustainable facade um yeah, again, it's, it's um, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a good point. I, I think I heard the other day that like a facade, you know, a building, the, the structure of a building, the, the core will, you know, will last for 60 years, but the facade will last for 25 years. So clearly there's a, you know, there's a, an imbalance here, you know. Um, so I, I suppose first we need to understand, well, what are you doing? Is it a replacement? I, you know, are we just replacing the facade? You know, uh, you know like, like, are we stripping the whole thing off? And, uh, you know, do we get to change the geometry of the glazing or the wall to window ratio? Or do we get to change all the materials? Do we put shading devices? You know, and in, in, from that sense, we have a much broader canvas within which to work, or is it more of a refurb? In other words, we're just replacing the glass and maybe replacing the framing that we can re-insulate and make better thermally performing, but we're maybe stuck to certain um, um, limitations or criteria that are already in place. Again, it's measuring, it's analyzing, it's, it's about understanding the existing state versus what you want to achieve, what the, what the budget is available and what can we achieve w within that, you know? Um, uh, so, you know, th there's lots of ways to, 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 to do it. Um, you know, it depends, I suppose, on what you want to get out of it and how much you're willing to put into it. Yeah. Uh, any kind of touch points that people should think of when they're deciding if they should totally, uh, you know, strip out the facade or just kind of give some, give a little facelift to it? Uh, yeah. Um, um, well, I, I think we need to consider like what the parameters are that we're trying to achieve. You know, is it code? Is it just like achieve code, you know, today's code? Is it, do we want to make it better? Is it a marketing play because we want a better performing building from a, you know, um, a real estate point of view? Is it a methodology that we want to, um, you know, uh, we want credential like lead or something like that? Or is it to reduce operational costs? You know, I suppose it's, you know, the best thing to do is understand why are we, why are we doing this, you know, um, and, you know, why are we replacing or why are we configuring or, or uh, refurbishing the facade? But honestly, I think these are questions that architects and engineers ask themselves every day, really, you know, um, you know, design is about solving problems within some fixed limitations or parameters. And this is no different. You know, all we can do is arm them with, better tools and, you know, more intuitive applications to allow them answer those decisions or answer those questions easier, quickly, accurately, you know, and, uh, and ultimately more cost effectively. And again, that's what we're trying to do at Finestra Pro. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, what projects are you most excited about in 2020? Uh, well, from a, from a personal point of view, within, the, the, within our company, we, we have a lot going on um, this year. Um, we're, we're excited about moving Finestra Pro away from, uh, you know, we've been traditionally a Revit based tool, you know, Revit obviously is Autodesk's building information modeling tool. And, you know, our core product has been uh, Finestra Pro for Revit, but we're evolving into more of a platform where, where, you know, you can, um, uh, um, you know, look at models from different authoring, tool, um, authoring tools and, you know, uh, share with non Revit users, for example, and but do all of those kind of facade analysis and envelope um, uh, decision making that we always could could within Revit. Um, so that's one big thing we're, we're very excited about. Um, our tie-ins to manufacturers, partic particularly around the glass industry um, and how their high performance product, high performance products can affect buildings and, you know, just again, allow designers optimize their, not just their geometry, but their 
materiality and the specification of glass or frame or whatever and 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 uh, help them to choose the best glass that they need to do this but also this you know so that they're they can again understand that balance you know that's something we're very excited about um um and i talked a little bit about building information modeling and leveraging that data within the model um uh you know, we're with it over the next 12 months. We're starting to look very closely at harvesting that data from and that early stage conceptual design and bringing it right through in a you know in a more streamlined manner. To, you know, tying sustainability into uh, fabrication and bringing those design decisions from day zero right through to the fabrication of your glazing assembly of or your your facade panels or whatever that might be. And you know, really you know, start to just get away from just building performance into things like reducing waste and, you know, streamlining offsite fabrication and th stuff like that, but always based around the facade where, you know, we're, we're facade people. That's what we understand. That's what we know. And that's what we're passionate about, I suppose. Yeah. Very cool. So how does somebody find out more information about Finestra Pro? Uh, you can, uh, uh, contact us through our website which is finestrapro.com um, I believe your website uh, I mean you've been uh, great partners to us at Applied Software um, I, I think uh, by uh, contacting us through uh, Applied Software um, uh, either uh, but yeah you know there's, there's a number of ways um, that you can get in touch and we'd be happy to discuss any further with you know designers uh, that want to discuss or maybe set up a demo or whatever that is for their colleagues you know happy to uh, happy to help awesome well simon thanks so much for joining the the podcast today and and talking about sure. this important uh topic of sustainability and, and unpacking it for sure. us so yeah thank you for your time and uh, really appreciate it and um the magic of the internet it was uh, very seamless uh, across across the atlantic that's right. That's right. Next time you're in Atlanta, you'll have to come into the, the office and we'll record it uh, another episode. Definitely. Definitely. Well, it won't be long. And, you know, I'm a, I'm a frequent visitor to Atlanta. It's a, it's a city I enjoy, you know. That's right. Well, we always love having you. So you're welcome anytime. Yeah, thanks. Well, thank you for your time again and uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks, Todd. Yeah, thank you. And thank you to all those listening. If you are interested in learning more, you can visit our sponsor, Applied Software at ASDI.com for more information. And you can listen to this podcast anytime by simply going to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, be sure to check out our website, bridgingthegappod.com. Until next time, I'm Todd Wyant, thanking you for joining us on the Bridging the Gap podcast. Keep innovating.